I would like to invite up to the stage Kim Samuel, who is the founder and chief belonging officer of the Samuel Center for Social Connectedness, and Jennifer Hollett, who is the executive director of The Walrus. Please, come on up. Good morning, Kim, and good morning to everyone in the room and those tuning in from home. I was saying to Kim earlier, what I really enjoyed about the symposium is the design, because I feel like I know the audience, because I've met so many of you in the breakout discussions, mm -hmm. over sharing a meal, uh, and more to come. And uh, Kim, while you're the author of On Belonging, it's really a book of our stories. And I mean that specifically because there are people I've read about in the book who are in this room. So what I'd love to do is start our conversation with a few questions I have, but really tap into some of those stories that are in the audience. And uh, one of the themes of the book is to really close the circle and make sure we're bringing that into our conversation this morning. But first of all, Kim, congratulations. Thank uh, you. Writing a book is, is a journey. Uh, it's very personal. Uh, this book has taken you around the world and, and beyond. And now you get to talk to mainstream audiences about belonging. So I'm so curious, what have you found to be one of the biggest misconceptions about belonging as you speak to audiences at book events and, and do interviews? Yeah, first, it's wonderful to be here in conversation with you today, Jen, and it's an understatement to say that some of the stories are in this room. It's true, a lot of the stories are in this room, but also the research team mostly consisted of people that were my students at McGill University, so it's very much a team effort. And, uh, and the Center for Social Connectedness played a huge uh, role, and we look at the book. I hope everyone uh, from my, my colleagues agrees, but we look at the book as, as really part of the center, uh, and for me, I guess, an added labor of love. To your, to your question, the, the public-facing aspect of this has been a journey within uh, a journey. Um, and so to, to begin, the book came out on September the 13th. And I really didn't know what to expect. I've, I've never done a podcast. No one will see my first one because I don't think, <laughs> I don't think the person's going to show it. It did not go well. And the second one, I don't recommend it. <laughs> The third one, it, not so bad. And, uh, and someone asked me the other day, just before the symposium uh, at a, a, a talk that I was giving in Toronto last week, how long is, is the book tour going to go on for? And I said, I don't know, I guess until, until I'm, uh, I'm not asked for interviews anymore. So I, I feel like <laughs> we're almost there. It's more about conversations now. The biggest misconception is, the, is a misconception with anything that is put in to this category that we arbitrarily call soft. So, oh, but this is easy. Belonging, yeah, I love it. I mean, I had, <laughs> uh, I had uh, COVID, as did probably several people in this room in 2020. And, uh, and then I had, um, I had pneumonia for two months after. And I went to New York to get physical therapy that I couldn't get here. And I walked and I walked and I walked to get my strength back. The point of that is that I saw the word belonging all over the place, uh, particularly in uh, houses of worship of many different faiths. And the irony was that they were all closed. <laughs> and, uh, but it stuck in my mind then that it's an easy word. Remember, sustainable development used to be an easy term. And, and this isn't easy. It's, it's a lot of work to build belonging, and it's not something that you can just do once and say, you know, done, done and dusted. So I guess the biggest misconception is that it's, it's soft and easy. It isn't easy, but it's joyful, but we have to work at it all the time. And do you find that some people want to put it in the self-help section versus, I would argue, there are lots of different sections in a yeah. bookstore that it could be found in? Yeah. Um, some people, um, fortunately, my publisher wasn't, wasn't one of them. And I should give, I haven't seen Jameson yet here today. Oh, hi, Jameson. Um, uh, just stand up for a sec. This is Jameson Stoltz, and he's the, um, 
the editor of the book. And um, I should also say that, uh, along with kind of the theme that we that particularly came out on panels yesterday, was how you need one person to believe in you, uh, and, and that's really at any age. And it was Jameson who, uh, after after a search for about two years to get an agent, and I wasn't being picky, <laughs> but then I got a great, a really great one, um, and then uh, quite a while after that to to get a publisher, it wasn't just anyone. It was Jameson and Abrams books that really believed in, in the book. And so we know that we did this together. I told, uh, I told Jameson last night at Creativity Night that I was, uh, uh, oh, how grateful I am uh, to him for, for what, uh, what he did for the book and, and for me to help me get the, the messages out. And, uh, and he said, well, sometimes people think that he's, he's just a bit hard on them. Um, I said, well, the good thing is I no longer take criticism to heart the way I used to <laughs> because it's all for a good, uh, a good purpose. And, and editing and editing will do that. That's no, like but, a norm in my but industry that's as well. I wanted, yeah. But I wanted, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. I wanted the, real, the real journey. But Jameson, right, you never thought of this book in the self-help help section, never. And um, nor did I. Uh, I self-help is, is a genre that doesn't, really appeal to me for the simple fact that I don't believe that you can save somebody else. And I don't believe that there's 10 easy steps uh, to anything. Uh, but I also, uh, for me anyway, I also felt that it was extremely important not to be prescriptive advice given to me by none other than Wendell Berry. And I interpreted that especially in the way of don't end the book with 10 steps of what you can do. Well, one is, I don't want people to just do for themselves. The whole point of this is reciprocal. And, and sometimes you don't know who's feeling isolated. It could be you, it could be someone else. And that idea of not only closing the circle, but rounding the circle came through. But there's still, uh, still questions of what can I do? And, and my answer is you, you know. And there's lots of examples in the book or turn to whoever is sitting next to you, but I didn't want to cut off people's imagination to not think things through for themselves. And I don't have the answer yeah. for anybody yeah. else. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd love to see it in public policy sections because I think there are a lot yeah. of policy yeah. answers in here. So as mentioned, the book has a lot of powerful stories. I would even argue case studies, but it includes your own story throughout. Yeah. When did you discover the importance of connectedness in a way that transformed your life? Because this is 24-7 for you now. And you're very clear yeah, in the book yeah. and even in this work that you know this is what you're meant to do. When did you have that, that moment? Yeah, I, I feel that is this is what I'm meant to do until the day I go home, leave this, leave this life, only that. But I think that that's the only the difference between me and, and I would imagine most people in this room that, that this is, uh, this is my, my path and it's, there's not a single day I don't wake up kind of, okay, okay, what's to do today? I first became aware, I guess is a better way to put it, because when I, when I look back at my, at my life, uh, there's been lots of that experience of what I call feeling, uh, feeling uh, all alone, sitting all alone at the bottom of a well. And you but, share that throughout. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. When I became aware of it was in uh, 1997 when uh, my father uh, had, had a, um, a very serious uh, brain injury and was in a coma for three months, which felt like 300 years. And then he, he woke up to say very, very slowly. And, and then it was time for him to go to a rehabilitation uh, hospital, which I've, I've noted uh, in the book and a lot since, only happened because my family was blessed to be able to afford that because my dad was 65 sundown years, insurance wouldn't pay a dollar for, uh, for rehabilitation. It was then that I started to see in my mind's eye a figure sitting alone at the bottom of a well. And I'm, I'm very, uh, I can't draw, I can't even draw stick people, but I'm very visual. <laughs> and the way I think is in, is in images and, and in pictures. And, and that figure came to represent social isolation. And I felt this, this kind of paradox looking at my dad that the, the, the more he healed, which was 
a lot to do, and he, and he, he had a lot, of, um, a lot of disabilities, but he never, he never changed, and anyone who has disabilities knows exactly what I'm saying. But he, uh, he was very sad because people that were well-meaning, no one was not well-meaning, but a lot of people just pretend not to see things. But even his good friends, they didn't know what to do, and, and it was, I had this image of, uh, of him and, and my mom a bit too, who had gone from wife, life partner of 40 years to primary caregiver. And she didn't really get any uh, from, from people around any care or respect for her well-being. And I just saw them kind of fading into the mist of their own lives. And I thought, well, he's, getting, he's getting better. We know he's, we, we had him for four more years, which is what a blessing. Um, but that, but that this was, it was the isolation. And it just occurred to me that this was entirely preventable and it shouldn't be happening. Okay, so fast forward. That's 1997. Uh, to uh, 2002, and I uh, got to meet uh, Nelson Mandela, and I, uh, I got to, to say to him, oh, about isolation, of course, you would know all, and I, I'll, I'm going to tell the story shortly because some of you have heard it before, you would know all about isolation, and he said, no, I've never been isolated. Not even in Robben Island, I said, no, he said, because in Robben Island, we were all brothers working together with a common purpose. I was never alone. And, and that just stopped me, stopped me cold. And I thought, how could, how could Nelson Mandela and, and his brothers in Robben Island prison that were, that were there for so, so many years, and he was imprisoned a total overall of 27 years, not feel isolated and yet feel lonely and so on. And that's when uh, it hit me, and, and uh, not like a shooting star or, or first first of July <laughs> fireworks that some people do. It was just this quiet affirmation of, okay, this is what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life. And then I went back and saw the rest of <clears throat> my life before then um, in a way that maybe I was afraid to before that, that I'd been lonely a lot. I, w I was the one that was really shy and really unsure of myself, and nobody could tell, because I'd put on this hat. I, d I didn't train myself. It's just be behavior that you learn to survive. Mm -hmm. I, everyone keeps telling me I have everything, so I cannot be unhappy. I cannot be sad. I cannot do that. That's not fair to people who say that must be what it's like. And uh, so I think it's also been 20, hopefully 20 years of some useful work, but also a lot of really good healing, too. Thank you for sharing that. And I will say as a reader, that story in your conversation with Nelson Mandela really jumps out. Uh, it's a very counterintuitive moment. So in your book, you have these incredible stories. And I want to hear the backstory on a few of them. And then we're going to check in with the people who are in this room. I've noticed that Special Olympics is a very big part of your life, of your book, and of this symposium. And I've met some incredible people involved with the organization. And really, movement is, is what I've learned about Special Olympics. Uh, but one athlete in particular, Loretta Claiborne, would love to hear, Kim, uh, how you uh, met and got to know Loretta. And then we'll go to Loretta to hear more about her story and leadership. Well, I'll begin with Loretta. I should say, when I interviewed Loretta, uh, we went on for over three hours, and then uh, we were both staying, uh, we were both house guests at the home of uh, Tim Shriver and Linda Potter, and, uh, and Tim uh, being the, the uh, chair of the Board of Special Olympics, and Linda being right in there in all, in all kinds of uh, activities as well, and they went out to dinner. And then they came back, and we were still at the kitchen table. And, and I forgot that I guess I had the longest running tape. I was using a tape recorder then, uh, r running machine in the world. But uh, to say about Special Olympics, it's, uh, it, really, it, it really is uh, the, the example of, uh, of what belonging is in practice. And Special Olympics, I think probably most people know, but just, just as a reminder, is, is based around sport and the power of sport to, uh, to bring about, I'll focus on inclusion, but we know bringing about a lot of things. And I love, and I put in the book, the credo of Special Olympics, that uh, Eunice Kennedy Shriver, the founder, 
uh, created, let me win, but if I cannot win, let me be brave in the attempt. And, and I think that there's a lot in there about strength and, and resilience and not victimhood and, and at the same time uh, very much honoring people's differences. Now, to Loretta, well, we had met before, uh, before we bonded. And we, uh, we bonded in, um, in, in Seoul, in South, South Korea. And we were kind of feeling both that we had out of, were having out of body experiences, flying from very far away for the Winter World Games. And uh, oh, I'll, I'll make this quick, because this is really just a friend story. You know how we've all been talking about how relationships breaking bread together over food? This was about in search for food. And we were in a, hot in a hotel and, and we were both lost. And Loretta asked me if I was lost. And I said, yes, are you lost? Okay, good, we're both lost. And there was a lot of in, you know, incredible Korean food. But you know when you've traveled so far and you maybe just want like a mac and cheese or something? That's how we were feeling. And so we... Uh, we, we found that one place that was called, it was a thing called American Style. <laughs> and it was literally called American Style? The, 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 that menu, that what we were looking at. And it was like, yeah, this is good. And then we just talked for a while. So it was that, uh, you know, the aphorism of all, all who wander, not lost. We weren't really lost. Um, Loretta and I... Uh, are, are really, uh, and I'm looking, I'm looking at two other close friends, Matt and Crystal, and many other friends in this room from Special Olympics. So it's hard to not just, just do what we did for a three hour interview and talk to your friend. But I want to say that even if Loretta wasn't my friend and someone I really love, and, and she, she was one of the big supports for me when I was really sick a couple of years ago, like Matt and Crystal, I would still say that Loretta is as kind and strong a person as you will ever meet. And ever since you were little, right, Loretta, you, you've had challenges, this is for sure. And you've never let them define you, and you never let them overcome you, quite the contrary. And you also had, you know, that one person was, was, was Rita, right, was your mom. Uh, that, that just would not accept anything less than for uh, all of her children to have every possibility for fulfillment in life. And then uh, Loretta just took that and changed the world. That's all she did. Uh, she's a world-class athlete. She's, uh, she's spoken to uh, kings and queens and the US uh, Congress and Harvard University and a lot of schools through the fall, which it's really good that this symposium did not conflict with one of those dates because Loretta would not change a date for this, not even for this, because that her commitment, that's it. And uh, when I look at Loretta, I just look and say that even though there's a lot of tough stuff in the world, the joy's always here. Oh, amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, Loretta, if you don't mind standing up, and I'll introduce you, Chief Inspiration Officer of Special Olympics International, Vice Chair of SOI Board of Directors. <laughs> Loretta, I would love for you just to share with the audience what belonging means in the work that you do. Belonging to me means not just having me there, and saying, oh, be a part of something. It's just like going to a dance. And somebody invites you to dance, but you can't dance. And to me, I always say belonging to me is not only inviting me, but having me be a part. And it'll make it much better for you if you get to know me. And once you get to know me and I get to know you, we'll become friends. When I look at my community, belonging to me means not just sitting there on the corner, but also taking part in that community, whether it's to help with going to the elections or whether it's to help somebody else in the community. That's what belonging means to me. And like Kim said, isolation, that's the worst thing somebody can go through. And we are in a, still in a time of isolation. And somebody called me up one time and they said, Loretta, how do you feel about the pandemic? I'm calling you because I know you're a person with intellectual disability. Is this isolating to you? I said, my whole life was isolation. This means nothing to me. Being in the pandemic, yes, I was sad that I couldn't go to the gym, but isolation to me, I lived it all my life, and many people like me. So 
when I look at belonging, when I feel as though I belong, and there are times I've been places where I thought I belonged and I didn't, even in the house of the Lord. Because I thought I belonged and I gave all my energy. And then one day somebody said something in front of a whole bunch of people and insulted me. I felt isolated. But I had to pick my boots up, put them back on, and go elsewhere and found the place where I thought I belonged. And I know, I know, when I first started Special Olympics, I said, oh, I looked at my mom. She says, oh, you're going to go back. I said, no, I quit. She says, no, you ain't. You don't quit nothing in my house. You understand? You don't quit until I tell you. Because <laughs> if you quit today, you always quit. So when I think about somebody isolating me, this world is big. And there's lots of people. I find somebody who wouldn't isolate me. I used to use my fists. By the way, I'm a fourth degree black belt. I could use my feet. <laughs> but to this day, I learned to handle things with humor well. instead of with my fists or with my feet. And there are too many people that I can find who would make me be a part of their lives. And that would make me feel better to be long. And when I belong, my heart is happy, my mind is happy. When I'm isolated, my mind is sad, and there's no heart. And then that's where the redemption comes of being angry. So I don't want to be angry. And thank you, Kim, for what you have done for our movement, Special Olympics. And when I look back at Special Olympics, yes, sport is the vehicle. But. We have so many other things. Our athlete youth meet, uh, people he, who were here yesterday, unified uh, group of people. Somebody says, oh, where's the, where's the young people at? They were here yesterday. And these are people with and without intellectual disability coming together to make it feel like this world that we can change in this time of isolation when one is learning about the other. So isolation is not cool. But feeling belong, and when you feel belong, you feel happy. Your heart is happy, and then your mind is happy, and then your community is happy. Thank you so much, Loretta. <laughs> so, Loretta, I have to just say, you really live it because I... Uh, recently in Toronto, we had the waterfront marathon back, and I was just so impressed by anyone <laughs> who ran like the half, the full. And so, um, you know, because you're this accomplished marathon runner, I just like much respect. And I was telling her about the marathon, and she said, Did you give it a try? I'm like, what? No. <laughs> but I love how you just like invited me in to do a marathon. And, um, you know, I, I was just like a bit like, What are you talking about? I could never. But that spirit of, but why not? Like, why not? Why not give it a try? Why not be part of something? So I appreciate that you do that with everyone that you meet. Thank you so much. Um, also in your book, Kim, is something called the SPI, the Social Progress uh, Index, uh, which is connected to uh, the research. And it's designed to measure social progress through a look at basic human needs, foundations of well-being, and opportunity. Can you tell me a little bit more on, on how it works and, and why it's important that we try to track this? Yeah, thanks. The uh, Social Progress Index comes uh, from the Social Progress Imperative, which is, is, I would say, ahead of its time, or it's met its time, to, to not only talk about how to, how to do social measures that, are, that, that really show both the intersectionality and the power of individual metrics to see not only how are we doing, but how far have we come from where, where we are. The measurement is really uh, important to me, and I'm always seeking out uh, economists and, and researchers that are really good with with numbers, the the uh, the quant people, mm -hmm. and that's uh, that's not only because numbers, for better or worse, influence policy, uh, and that we were we're all for should be all for data driven decision making, but also because we can see 
by, by what numbers are missing or what data is missing, really what a, even a, a country or an organization or a municipality is focusing on or not. And my, uh, my interest and involvement in, in measurement uh, goes all, maybe 30, 30 years, always with a view, like everything I do, align myself with you know, the added people that are way more qualified than you and just bring your passion there and see what happens. So we, uh, we also have um, Angel Shu in the room who heads, <coughs> excuse me, uh, data-driven lab, which is uh, at UN, UNC, and they, uh, they're measuring the, uh, the rela at many things, but, but in particular, um, around environment in particular, for us is about the relationship between uh, environmental, uh, environmental performance and global warming, global co climate change, and cities, and, uh, and, and, and where does that fit with urbanization, in, in inclusion, where does it fit? So to say that I've been part of this for a while, and now in the book, there's that research, there was some new research done for the book, and then with my uh, colleagues, uh, at Oxford, at the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, we're looking at the relationship of multi-dimensional poverty and, uh, and belonging. Um, I've learned, I try to close my ears only to this, that it's very hard to do this because there's no content, but you can measure inclusion and well-being. It's like, this is, this, is, this is not a new thing. It's a thing that lifts it up, and, uh, and that's been incredible, too to look at multi-dimensional poverty in this way, and I'm, I'm grateful to my mentor at Oxford, Sabina Alkire, for giving me the opportunity. Now over to Matthew and the uh, Social Progress uh, Index. They, uh, they partnered with, I say partnered with the book because I don't mean partnered with me, but so I mean with, with all of, uh, sure. a lot of energy and a lot of people in, in the book too, to begin to look at what measures in, in their index could not only, uh, I should say, align, align with belonging, so you can bring in social isolation, and you can bring in social connectedness, and then if you like the four Ps, people, place, power, purpose, right. then you can bring them in, or bring in your own framework. But the point is to get people to, to look at this as something that, for me, it, it is important that it's measured, what is really important, more important for me, is to put those tools in the hands of policymakers and even people within government or people within industry that this is their, their area, to give them the tools to be heard no matter what. And no matter what would mean, for example, there's a lot of uh, predictions these, uh, these days about an impending global recession. I want to make sure that soft stuff, which I, I replace the word soft with important, is, uh, is remaining strong. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'd love to ask Matthew to stand up, and we'll get a, a microphone your way. Here oh, we go. There we go. Mm -hmm. Oh, great, you have a yeah, mic on I there. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, as the founder and board member of the Social Progress Imperative, which publishes the Social Progress Index, what drives it up and what drives it, it down? If you can explain like how it works. By the way, Canada's number six, so I, I checked. Well, actually, no, bad news. Canada's number 10. Oh, we dropped? We dropped this oh, year. Oh, gosh, OK. So okay. Um, the origins of the Social Progress Index were uh, the, the big financial crash of 2008, where I think it brought home to anyone that didn't already know it that if you just focus on, on money and measures like GDP, uh, you're going to mislead yourself and your country about whether you're going in the right direction or not. And a lot of GDP was going up and people were saying we're getting wealthier and wealthier, but the reality was the underlying societies were in real trouble. And so we said, well, let's measure. This is a whole group of people involved around the world in social change. We got together and said, we need to measure um, our progress in ways that aren't related to money, but are related to real outcomes in communities. And we basically raised some money, we put a team together of economists and, and so forth, and we um, produced our first index uh, in about 2011, uh, comparing about 140 countries around the world. And we've published it every year since, and it now um, is also in many countries going down to the very local level, so you can have your own community social progress index. We have a number of partners of mayors of, of cities and things doing that. 
There are three main, there are 12 components that we, we group into three uh, pillars of, 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 of four each. One is around basic needs, so it's new access to good nutrition, to shelter, to water and sanitation. Um, then there's uh, what we call foundations of well-being, which is sort of access to higher education, to information, to um, a safe environment, uh, to uh, a sustainable economic envir uh, environment, so ecosystem. And then we have uh, the third component, the third pillar um, is um, opportunities and rights, which is really getting at everything from, you know, can you get to, to higher, access to higher education? Can you get access to um, mental health support if you need it? Can you marry who you want or live where you want? Those sorts of things. Um, and what we're seeing over the last 10 years since 2011, yeah. the world has, has moved by, up by 5.5 percentage points uh, in terms of social progress globally. However, in the last five years, the rate of progress has slowed dramatically. Um, and to the extent that when we published our results this year, we, we said we think we're on the brink of the world's first global social progress recession. Um, so unless things change very fast, this is, we're about to start going backwards for the first time. In that, in that sample size, in that sample that we've looked at, Britain is one of four countries that has gone backwards over 10 years. So its social progress score is lower than it was 10 years ago. Canada is 10th, United States is 25th. The United States has been going backwards in the last five years. Um, Canada has actually gone backwards on individual rights, which is one of the areas which globally uh, is driving things in the wrong direction. So, you know, over, overall, inclusion is falling globally and um, individual rights are going backwards. The big area where things have gone By the forward, way, I'm seeing some nods. I'm seeing Canadians yeah. and Americans going, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think in most countries, many, many countries, that's now happening. And where things have improved most has been access to information, particularly through the internet. But as uh, Kim writes in the book and what came out of our research was, you can, in many places, increase access to information, but actually that isn't always a positive unless you have the right kind of social system in place around giving people access to the internet and social media, actually it can have quite a negative effect on belonging. And what we did in the research for the book was to look at how does belonging and social progress interact. And the countries that had the strongest score on the belonging index were also those that did best in terms of creating social progress. So the two are highly integrated. And those countries that saw their uh, information score rise very fast but didn't have that improvement in terms of belonging actually, in some ways, are the more uh, damaged countries that really seem to, to be going in the wrong direction at the moment. And that would include America, I think, even more than Canada. Thank you so much. And for anyone who's interested, would like to see how certain countries have done, it can be found online. Yeah, socialprogress.org. So Excellent. check it out. And we, we're looking for more and more local partners who want to see what their community is doing in terms of social progress. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Kim, as we continue to walk through the pages of your book with people in the room, uh, I'd love to learn more about the work that Becky Cook is doing, who's also in, in the room. Uh, you write about her work uh, and incredible stories, I would say, of engagement in indigenous communities uh, yeah. throughout where, the book. Where are you, Becky? Hi, Becky. Uh, well, um, yeah, Becky, uh, Becky Cook is... Uh, is, a, is another amazing uh, woman here today. Not that you're not amazing, Matthew. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to say, uh, I should say, sorry, uh, Becky is uh, from uh, Grand Rapids in Manitoba, uh, from the Misipawistic uh, Cree community. And uh, Becky uh, is, is instrumental in the uh, Guardians uh, program. 
and uh, you may be asking her a bit about this, but I, uh, I, I want to say that why, why you mean so much and the community means so much is that uh, the first time that I went there, uh, I didn't have to say that I didn't really know very much. It was obvious, but I said it too, that I was just there to learn. <laughs> Um, and I think about inviting, you know, the thing of inviting someone into your home. And I think about when, when uh, you go and do a field, field research. And I've been to lots of different countries and been part of that. And you literally go into someone's home where they live. And you're going in there and uh, they don't know you. And you're there to learn about their their life and their traditions. And most of us, I wouldn't, I mean, I'd think twice before letting us say, no, I don't need, I don't need that. I was asked a lot. I, I raised um, my one child, Caitlin's a single mother. You don't know how, what's it like being like a single mother? What's it like? Is it different? And I thought, I just don't really need to answer that. So I want to say for Becky, the first time that I went there, I didn't meet you the first time. I met your sister Heidi and uh, Ovid Mercredi, who we, who's in the book, who we mentioned uh, earlier. And what I felt was uh, what I'm going to call just a culture of welcome. And uh, it was OK to be there to learn. And, and take as long as we needed to know, uh, to get to know one another. And I thought that was really important too because I, I think sometimes we rush to do that. And, and so some years later, uh, we're, 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 we, I would say part of, because I, I, don't, I don't really, I'm, I'm choosing my words carefully. And that's really the way it is with most of, most if not all, we have two of our own programs, the Samuel Center for Social Connectedness. And even there, we're really there the way I, I see it is to hold a space intentionally and that, that uh, and listen, and that that's, and that that's the leadership that, that uh, it's, 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 you don't have to go farther than that, but to do that, to listen well and to hold a space well. Um, Becky and I have a long standing fishing date that we haven't had. Be Becky's just, uh, like everyone that I wrote about in the book, you can look at what they're doing and you could look at the community, whether it's a geographical community or, or a community of, of people with, a, with a, a similar interest or so on, or the story that I was telling yesterday about the custodial worker at a Butaro Hospital in Rwanda who, uh, who was there on an on a amazing day opening a new cancer wing and Paul Farmer was there and President Kagame was there, uh, but it really didn't matter because you could meet anyone, including, including Jean-Baptiste, who emanated the belonging and what that was. And so I'm really glad that I've gotten to know you the most, Becky, uh, but I also, I also see this beautiful circle going round and round and, and uh, in that circle is room for me. Well, Becky, I'd like to invite you to uh, stand up. Uh, Becky Cook, Program Coordinator of a Traditional Learning Program in her community. And would lo love to hear about the culture of belonging in the work that you're doing. Sure, thanks, Jen. And thanks, Kim, for inviting me here and giving me the opportunity to speak and holding that space, like you say. Um, I think for cultural belonging, uh, some of the work that I've been doing more recently is about talking to a group of our elders, some of which are here, about what does education in our way look like? Uh, and uh, what, are, what are important things for us to teach our kids? And within that, uh, we have different teachings. So we see the world as Everyone has something to bring to the table. And we always sit in a circle, and that's symbolic of you know all of us bringing together our gifts. So our education system is about recognizing, helping the children and the youth to recognize what their own gift is. You know, and Kim was kind of telling her story about finding out that, that this work on belonging is Kim's path, and no one can tell Kim that that's her path. And that's the way that we see the world. Every person is the only one that knows what is their path in life. And the work that we try and do with the youth, and, and you know, we're, we're also working on trying to build a new educa education system because uh, you know, 
it's really hard for me to see how we can change uh, the the current system. So that's the work that I'm doing. You know, I don't believe that I can change the current system, um, but uh, I want to work within my community to help youth and even other community members recognize what it is that they bring to this world and you know, also help them to find the tools to allow them to bring their gifts forth and to do that work that they're meant to do. Um, you know, Canada uh, has a storied history with colonization and you know, I, I did want to mention something about uh, the belonging within that Kim talks about. Uh, that's another big part of uh, the indigenous story in Canada. For me, when I read about that belonging within, it's, it's about feeling like okay with yourself. And because of a lot of the colonial history in Canada, uh, I don't know, you know, I'm sure people know a bit about it, but you know, uh, in the Indian Act, uh, Canadian law actually defined indigenous people as something other than human. And, you know, if you got an education or if you, you know, uh, decided to renounce your, your Indian status, you could be a person. And, you know, the ways that the government worked to uh, bring people out of being an Indian, I guess we'll just say that, right? The residential school systems, we all have heard about these. Uh, you know, did a lot of damage and uh, people internalize that and I think you know in the book with all the stories that Kim tells too you know that's the same story uh, that I hear through all these dismembered communities right that we're told we're not good enough we're told we're less than we're told that uh, we don't belong in this society we don't have a place in this society and and when you internalize that uh, it can be really detrimental uh, to your health and to your ability to bring something to community. So, you know, finding that belonging within, you know, and helping people to heal from those traumas, that's a huge thing for me. And, and that's the, almost the first step, I think, with what we're doing with the youth. But, and then also helping them to see that they have something to bring and that they can do that and to raise them up and, you know, like... Just like Kim kind of holds up, holds up these different projects that are working in different communities, like I see myself working on a different level within the community and helping, you know, the youth and, and the different people, the elders, and connecting youth and elders and bringing back that cultural learning. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's really good to see everyone here and having everyone working together because we need that, you know, people working on all those different levels, international, national, and even on the local community level to really make this movement a success. Thank Thanks. you so much for sharing in the work that you're doing. Kim, another story that you share in the book is about how a family-owned melon company in Honduras is a, a great example of how business can build belonging. And I think that we're seeing that there are a lot of businesses interested in taking more responsibility for the work that's done in community or even connecting with staff. So I'd love to learn a little bit more about this story and then we'll yeah. invite Pamela to, to share some thoughts. Okay, good, thank you. I. Um I got to know about uh, about Pamela and um, about her her family's uh, business uh, Agolibano in Honduras through the uh, Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, which is not where I expected to find the business, the private sector uh, story for the for the book. And I knew it was really important to to do this, but I. I wasn't short of examples, but what I wanted to find, and, and, and thank you to you, Pamela, I did, uh, was, 
was an example where I wasn't going to be describing um, a company's DEI program, which is not to say that's not extremely, extremely valuable, but I couldn't find a way to do it in, 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 in the book I was writing, to be true to the book, that wasn't going to say, here's a shining example, and this is how they the do. The prescriptive yeah, style yeah, yeah, that you were trying to avoid. Don't be prescriptive. Mm -hmm. and, and what I wanted and what I found is an example of a, a business, happens to be a family uh, business, and my family has a business. I haven't been nearly as successful as Pamela in, in integrating my, my passion there, but that wasn't, right, Becky, that wasn't my path. Um, and, uh, and to show that, that, yeah, it's very important to measure, just talked about measurement uh, with Matthew, and at the same time, it's how does, the, how does the company operate and that its values can be seen, just like Jean-Baptiste that I saw in Rwanda, that you could, you could meet anybody there and they would be talking about the same story. And so even though you know, businesses are, uh, are generally uh, aiming to, uh, to make a profit, it's not enough. It's not enough to have a program that balances that out. It has to be what and how, what you're doing is matching up with how you're doing it. And the best place to look, I believe, is at the people who work there and their families. And you're a role model to me. And it's really funny because we we're only meeting face to face today. We, we've, uh, we've done all the technology things, but the first thing we did is gave each other, you know, that, that, that hug of so many of us haven't seen each other, <laughs> met each other, and are meeting here. And I just felt such a solidarity. And I do feel such a solidarity with you. Amazing. So Pamela Molina, if you could stand up. Uh, sustainability Director of Agro Labeno, and would love to just hear your reflections on the work that you're doing and how you bring belonging into the business. Hi, everybody, and thank you, Kim, for having me here. And for me, it's a blessing. This is something um, for us. We are a family business. We produce melons. I don't know if you have. You like melons? Yes. We have melons the in answer the is yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Are delicious and sense cut, sense cut because it's cut opportunity that we ha export the melons around the world here to Canada. You can find our melons too during the, the season. But at the end, um, we decided to be a different company because we strongly believe that business success is the opportunity to transcend from success to significance. And we really believe that can not be successful companies, we cannot be sustainable for long term in if our communities are failed. And in Honduras, you know, many of you have, have listened maybe from Honduras, dif difficult situation, because we are very poor country, very poor in the neighboring communities running our farm. We start working with them in 2010 with the commitment to de decrease the multidimensional poverty in these communities. We right now are working in 19 communities with, with more than 3,000 3, families. And in the middle is our programs are the children's because we truly believe that the child has to have different opportunities. We have to take care of them. So for us, it's very important to start in the beginning of life with pregnant women. We start with them, teaching them how to take care of their pregnancy, and then how to take care of their child with love. Um, this program has had very good result because when we start, we have 14% of malnutrition rates in our communities. And the last year, we measure 5%. This is a huge change. It's changing the reality of a lot of kids in our communities. And then we open the opportunity for this kid to have access to health and education because some, some, some people in my country think that I am a little bit crazy because I am working in so many de deprivation in our communities. Then we look for the opportunity for kids to start a, um, education, a quality of education. So we are working in 14 public schools surrounding our farms to improve the quality of education, to improve infrastructure, pedagogical aspects, and then um, with this, we are looking to achieve a free 
uh, free communities poverty because we strongly believe that with education is the only opportunity to change our realities. Because of that, uh, we improve uh, technology, uh, we teach the teachers new methodologies, how to teach access to computers, access to different, uh, like uh, to produce food in the, in the gardens of the schools. We teach the kids to produce food. And something very important is that we are looking how the kids get more years of education because we study the multidimensional poverty in our neighboring communities in 2018 from our commitment to approach to belongings. And because of that, right now, we are looking how, because in Honduras, the, the middle education is four years. Right now, we are looking to achieve at least nine years of education for kids in, in our communities. And we are, right now, very proud to, to see how that we don't have kids less behind. We are just looking every one of them and looking for them to return to school and then if they don't have the age to have uh, the, the opportunity to be at school, we have other programs with alternative education uh, to continue to continue leveraging their, their education. Other important program in our community is that we are working with the communal organization. We strengthen and then the leadership, the conscious leadership to have a culture of peace in our communities. And this is something very huge because when we empower people through knowledge, they work together and right now in all our communities, the people work together, strain their, their capacities together and work for their development together. And we are working with them to create plans of development of the communities. This is so important, so important because the people get involved in every step in the development of their communities. And we work with them with food security access. We work with them with education, health access. Uh, we strengthen public uh, health facilities too, to access, to leverage the quality of access to health. And then at the, at the center are the kids, the power of the kids. And we saw uh, this, this decrease of malnutrition, but in, 2020, in 2021, we did, we did another step working in the, 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 the decrease of poverty. And we did the business, business MPI too in our, in our business. And right now we are working in a project no, that name is We United, We Grow United with our collaborators. And we are looking to become a free poverty company. And we are working with the collaborators and their families, looking for opportunities for education for their children, for access to quality of education, because in my, my country, there uh, are structural pro problems in health and in education. And that's why I do, I do it with love, with passion. Uh, I work very hard in these programs. And I I'm, I'm really believe that when we measure, when we measure and we have an idea what we are working on, what are the goals that we want to achieve to decrease deprivation of the families, if we can all together measure the MPI, this is an excellent tool for companies to work in our social investment and to work to become a free poverty co company. For me, has been a blessing to find the business MPI, and right now measuring in our company. We are the first company in the world, because Hopi has told me that is working with measuring MPI in communities and in the company. And we are the first company in Honduras working in a project directly to decrease the poverty of their collaborators. So I am very proud to, to, see, to, to be an example that is possible for us because we have a lot of blessings uh, to share these blessings and to be, um, I thought this is an um, intelligent business or like systemic approach because if we want to continue being a business for generations to come, we have to look for the less behind in our communities and in our country. So thank you, Kim, for having me here and thank you for everybody. Um, really. Beautiful, 
beautiful and beautiful world of uh, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Pamela, thank you for sharing your leadership work. Uh, Kim, I have another question for you, then we're gonna open up yeah. the audience in case anyone has any questions for Kim um, or about the book specifically. Uh, I know some people have already read it and some people got their hands on it yesterday. I wanna come back to your aha moment because I'm really fascinated by how someone can appear to be alone, but completely connected mm -hmm. and in community. Mm -hmm. and how someone could be surrounded by people but completely alone. What's going on? <laughs> I don't think it's that, that hard to be either of those people, except that, except that the one that is completely alone, surrounded by people, could get missed. The one that is all alone, that is... Uh, maybe not missed by people because they're all alone, could have also chosen, chosen to be alone, which I call solitude, right? Like your alone time. And I think then the answer to your question lies in, in what, what would be missing in either of those? And, and maybe I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer it in, in terms of not only individuals, although in the end we're all individuals, but in terms of groups of people that can be uh, marginalized uh, for a very long time uh, and not, I'm, I'm gonna pick up on what you said, you know, Loretta, that you've, you've, you've experienced isolation your whole life and I don't think many people meeting you would actually see that. And, and so, so thank you for sharing that. And I think that, I think that what Loretta is, is talking about, among, among other things, is being a person with, with disabilities that, that uh, the, the rules can say something and the policies can say something. And when we, when we uh, gather at, at, at special Olympics events or, or uh, self-advocates, um, where there are self-advocates, but self-advocacy -ad organizations like MASS, gather, people gather together, you're not feeling that. The, the, that's community. It's that kind of gap, right? It's, it's the gap between where things are how they should be. Like when we were all hanging out and dancing and like people, I can't dance, but like we were all dancing last night and everyone was having fun and no one had to work hard at that. That's that feeling. That feeling is how life should be. And yet I believe that we struggle so much from where there's that situation created for all of us, and also where you have your, your agency and your, your choice, right? Like what Loretta was talking about and others have, have talked about this morning are, are measures like the SPI that, that, don't, that don't only get at the thing they're measuring, but you get into the intersectionalities and the gaps, and that's often where isolation is. So people that, that can be experiencing this a lot of the time, maybe having the best year of their life, but as as, for example, people living with uh, IDD or, uh, or, my, or my dad being, and, and at 65, which I increasingly see is rather young. Um, <laughs> yes, young and vibrant, but, but, yes. But for, you know, for, for people that are, that are older people, it's not, it's not because they're older, right? I'm looking at Judy Oval, this is, she knows, the Grandmother Project, is because of the way they are treated, because they are older. It's not because, people have disabilities? No, it's because of the way they are treated because they have disabilities. People living in poverty, and as we talked about, not only income, Matthew mentioned, not only income poverty, but, uh, but, but poverty in, in many different areas, including the absence of social connectedness. It's not because they're poor, it's because of the way they're treated because they're poor. And I could go on and, and, and we, can, we can certainly, certainly absolutely add uh, racism and colonialism and the rise of authoritarianism into that mix. It's the because of, you know, the shadows are bad enough. It's, it's what happens in broad daylight that scares me the most. Okay. And, uh, and the paradox isn't a paradox for me anymore. It just means, uh, it just means I'll be working for the rest of my life. 
uh, be, because these perceptions and these ways of someone has to other, put down, make less, right? Becky was right, less than human in order to feel good about themselves. That is not a human condition. That is a human choice. And, and I believe that we can, every day, by the way, choose one way or the other way. And, uh, and, then, and then we're all in there together because anyone could feel isolated. I mean, anyone could, uh, could feel isolated and have a mental unwellness diagnosis. It doesn't, it, when I say it doesn't matter to me, it means you can feel isolated. However, there are no labels here. But you, uh, you, you, you can also feel a balance of feeling isolated and feeling connected. And, and for a lot of people, there is no balance. It's like, remember teeter totters? This is a, dating myself, but it, it's yeah. like that. Yeah. That's not fair. All right, thank you. We have some mics and want to now look to the audience for your input. Yeah, we'll get a mic, mic over here. Yeah, great. Okay, yeah. Right here, Tony, right here, right, yeah. Um, my name is Tony I'm an advocate. Now, I want to play with everybody by the commandment. A couple of years ago, I had a, a poem. Ah. And this poem is, who is number No. I'm looking out for number one. If you're looking out for number one, that means one. That means you don't have nobody. Mm -hmm. But God gave me two eyes, gave me two natural. How can you be number one when there's nobody there? Let mm. be number one. Oh, over. I think we better think of number two. Mm -hmm. Book number two means that you will have a partner. Mm. Yeah. You will be able to relate to that partner as a person. See, this is going to get deep because I wrote this when I was 40 and I'm 65 now. Young and vibrant, as we were saying, yes. <laughs> so, so don't look at yourself as number one, but look at yourself as number two. And number two means that you are going to be there for the next person that needs help. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Tony. It's clear you're a poet uh, because that's such a great way of putting it, which is uh, instead of looking out for number one, which is what our whole culture and society is really built on, is looking out for number two so that you have a partner so that you're in community. Yeah, first, uh, Tony, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And I, I, couldn't have, uh, I couldn't have brought out that that feeling the way you did. So thank you for doing that because this is really in the end, how do we all feel? You know that, you said like that thing of look out for number one, right? And we're always told look out for number one and, and then there's the song, you know, one is the loneliest number that you ever heard. Mm -hmm. And yet, yeah, and it's, I know I've been, I've been that. <laughs> um, and, and yet, and yet we continually get, it's like we're talking about like changing systems here. We continue to continually get this message that, you know, be number one, 
be the best, right? Be the best. If you're if you're someone in school and you're uh, you know you're you're getting C's, you got to get B's. If you get B's, then you got to get A's. You got A's, then let's go to A pluses. Why aren't you always getting an A plus? You're capable of it. It never ends, Kim. It never ends. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing and the thing is that the the number one is 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 really thriving, what, like what you said in number two, and it doesn't have to be in my, it doesn't have to be a partner, like a, a romantic partner or, or a spouse. Sometimes that can be a very lonely situation too, but it's about, um, I'm gonna try, see if Tony, if this makes sense, but it's, it's about reciprocity. Number one and number two have to be together. And yeah, and sometimes, in care, sometimes you're the one that needs the care, and sometimes you're the one who's giving it. I mean, I, I told a true, absolutely true story, and I told it with humor, because we talked about humor, not only to get through the hard things, but humor, humor I think, and love can go really close together, too. And when my, when my sister, Tammy, who's, who's always with me, but, but not on this earth, when she had uh, cancer that was... Uh, Anyway, like all cancers are serious, and hers was before we knew that that uh, that she was terminal, and she was getting um, uh, really tough uh, chemo uh, treatments. And we came out of the uh, in, in Toronto, Princess Margaret Hospital, one day, and and I was her uh, I was her sister, and with her, and also the most squeamish person you're ever going to meet, especially about needles. And we were coming down the long steps of that hospital, and someone came up to us, um, a, a stranger, who uh, who put out his arms, and he and and basically re reassured it's going to be okay and that was for me not my sister <laughs> because i was the one who was kind of uh, had a, had the the pale face and and uh, and and was sort of shaky it was because of all the all the uh, watching watching my sister who uh, who was really my caregiver through all that and she said it's always about you sis that was my one and two story mm. and and um I think we should even just like what Tony said, we should just hold that in our hearts because we all know them. That feeling of when you felt isolated, it could also be a time that you felt that you belonged. And when I think of my times that I feel belong, there are always other people there. And they're not strangers, even if they, it's yeah. that connecting. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, amazing. We have time for a couple more questions. and want to make sure we're also looking out to both corners of the room. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we have one here. We'll get a, a mic to you. <clears throat> um, just in regards to the uh, the social index and all of that, which I've always found to be a, an interesting concept, um, I know Special Olympics uh, was exploring doing something similar. Um, <clears throat> what do you think would be the most effective way to actually use that index? Because the concern, I'm not going to lie, that I have with a lot of those things is is how we could use them in a negative way, how we could politicise it, how we could use it to create mechanisms of cooperation and disconnect, how we can alienise countries, and also, is it going to go down to the bottom? Because that's always the concern I have with all of these conversations. They always seem to be up here, but how does it translate to the bottom? Like, what are your thoughts on the most effective way to create that? Comes back to the number one thing, right? Of yeah. striving for number one. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Ben. Um, I'm gonna, if it's okay with you, and we've talked, we've been talking about this kind of for a while, right? And about um, about how kind of the value of measurement, and and certainly in Special Olympics, how do you, you know, how you how you're measuring attitudes, perceptions, inclusion, and. And, and all the examples, including Special Olympics, that I've touched on today, measurement isn't only for the, uh, the measurement and evaluation of a, of a project. So first of all, is knowing what it is you want to do with that. But I'm gonna answer the question in, uh, in a slightly different way, which is measurement has to have research, right, to do it. And so I'm gonna start with this radical idea. 
have the people doing the research be the people who know the problem, who are the people that are experiencing that thing the most? Because we say, and in this room I know we mean it, that that's where the expertise lives and the solutions live and so on, and yet, um, and yet so many times, and I say not, not the examples I, I gave, which is partly why I put those ones in, in the book, is that it's always, the, the research is if, based on, if you want to, understand someone's situation, you ask them. They will tell you the answer and believe them. And I want to go farther than, uh, than that, is that research should, should be designed, we were talking about designed, from the beginning, not something to come in after, and to break down uh, what I see is as a kind of a, a, if I can say this, I don't, Becky, I'll try it out here, because like, we're looking at each other, this kind of co colonization of of not only of education, but of research, where uh, a, someone goes to a community research, is practically everyone there is to say, we promise that we won't le learn anything from this, we promise that this will not be <laughs> useful to us, and that we will not benefit in any way, so don't even give me lunch today. And that has to change. And just one last point, when I was, uh, uh, being um, when I was interviewing people for the book, I had the opportunity to interview the head statistician at Human Rights Watch, and uh, and and we were talking about this issue of what collaboration looks like and partnership really looks like in in the design. And then I said, oh, by the way, you know, by the way, when we're talking, uh, I'm going to be writing about. Uh, about uh, forced migrants in, in the book. Can you tell me overall uh, about updated stats on the movement of migrants, and in particular the movements, the movement of refugees? And, because uh, I only have from a few years ago. And he said, well, we, no, we don't, like, we, we don't have that, but, I said, but you, this is what you do. He said, Kim, he said, I want you, we have the, we, I want to say their research is great, not to disparage it. But he asked me this question, and I'm going to leave this with everybody, as a, then, then turn back to you. He said, who do you think decides what gets researched? People in power decide what gets researched. And that's why uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of gaps between what gets researched and what's needed and who's doing it. And the link to policy or wherever you want to make the difference with that information that you have if it's, if it's not in your design, with your agency and choice and knowingness, and if the system is still uh, a colonial one in education, for example, then, then it's, it's a bit of banging your head against a wall, right? And then and making in, incremental gains. So I think it comes back to it, is that measurement is only as good as the values, not only the value behind it. Well, we're at time, but Kim, thank you for capturing this symposium, this room, these stories in your book. And uh, I encourage everyone who's just got their hands on it to not only read the book, to use it as a tool. I overheard someone say yesterday, finally, we have a book, right? We have That's it what in I one say. place. Yes, <laughs> finally. Congratulations. Thank you thank so much, you. Kim. Thanks, Jen. Thanks to you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.